Hey, good evening, uh, everyone. Shana Tova. All the different um, customs that people use to greet each other these days. It's not so clear how you greet each other between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. Um, some say Gemar Tov, some say Good Yom Tov, some say uh, whatever. Um, but it does say in all the holy books that this period between Yom Kippur and Sukkot is a very purifying period because Yom Kippur cleaned the slate and the days before Sukkot, uh, the Jewish people are busy preparing for Sukkot. So they don't have time to get into trouble. What do you think? Is that uh, true? Huh? <laughs> Maybe in this day and age you can do a lot of things. But, but anyway, the Medrash puts it this way. So therefore these four days are like a, uh, are considered to be f- further purification. And as a matter of fact, when it says, L'kachta l'chem b'yem harishin which is the verse that states that the first day of Sukkot, B'yam Arishan, you shall take the four species. So the Medrash says, B'yam Arishan, Rishan l'shcheshben avoynes, that the first day of Sukkot is the beginning of when you start counting the new year of sins. I know it sounds weird, but that's the expression. Because uh, till then, as I said, Yom Kippur, and the days afterwards, you're too busy to, uh, to, uh, to so-called transgress. Anyway, this is a period that we're in. I hope everybody had a very uh, purifying Yom Kippur. I know those of us that were in this room on Yom Kippur had a very um, profound experience, right? and um, including myself. Uh, it, was, it was far from mechanical. It was quite uh, personal. And, uh, and I was honored to pray with uh, those of you that were here. In the truth, we all pray with each other no matter where we are in this world. Time and space is really transcended. And, uh, of course, the biggest challenge is not so much what happens on Yom Kippur itself, but what happens the next day. Can we carry the inspiration, or can we carry it into our lives? So, to continue the theme of this period of, this period of time, this month, and uh, those of you that have been here in the previous classes, or if you follow 60 days, just in general... We know that uh, the Jewish calendar is really a very uh, profound and very um, eloquent structure that reflects the cycles of life. And in that sense, this whole sequence of the holidays, Rosh Hashanah, and ten days later Yom Kippur, and four days later Sukkot, are not incidental. They do come as a sequence, meaning that they all complement each other, and they're all part of a, a larger story, a bigger story. So the big story is, as we've discussed many times, really began actually over 120 year, days ago. Well, to start from the beginning, the Jews leave Egypt on the 15th of Nisan, which is literally six months ago. Um, and uh, they leave Egypt, they become a nation. Fifty days later, they arrive at Sinai and receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. And, and, and that period they count, the 49 days of the Omer, between the second day of Passover and Shavuos. And then 40 days later, Moses returns after being on Mount Sinai with the tablets. And he sees that the Jewish people had built a golden calf. That's the 17th of Tammuz. So essentially 50 days from Passover to Shavuos, and then 40 more days from Shavuos till the 17th of Tammuz. And he shatters the tablets for this grave sin that they did. And he marches back up on the mountain immediately to beg for forgiveness for them. And he stays on the mountain for another 40 days. So we have 50, 40, 40 so far. And he comes down on Rosh Chodesh El, the beginning of El, and uh, not having achieved at least full forgiveness. And he goes back up. There are different opinions, but he goes back up the same day, the next day. But regardless, it's somewhere in the first or second day of Rosh Chodesh of El. And again, 40 days, the third 40. And this time, the 40 days will end and conclude on Yom Kippur. So basically, Passover to Yom Kippur is 50 plus 120, 170 days. And it's in this sequence, 50 days from Passover till Sinai, 40 
till the breaking of the tablets, 40 more till the beginning of El, 40 more till Yom Kippur. And now we are a few days after that. 170 days have passed, or 120 days if you count it from the time he came, he went up on Sinai. And now, four days after Yom Kippur, begins another holiday, the holiday of Sukkot. So it's clearly all part of one big picture. In, in psychological or I could say even in personal terms, the story is one of really the story of our lives, of all our lives. We experience, we begin in a state of bondage, bound to whatever inhibitions and whatever Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim in Hebrew means the word from the word Metzar, which means a, like a boundary, or more specifically, any type of fear, inhibition, limitation, constraint that traps us, which is why we say that, a, that we are obligated to remember Yitzhiz Mitzrayim leaving Egypt in every generation. Which means in every generation a person is obligated to remember that we left Egypt. In some places it adds every day. And actually every day at the end of the prayer, the morning prayer, we actually remember the sheish. There's the six remembrances called the sheish schiris. And we actually mention and remember the leaving of Egypt. How, what, what's the significance of that? Why should we have to now, thousands of years after the exodus, continue to remember that we're leaving Egypt? It happened so long ago. The answer is because it's not Egypt, the physical land. It's the symbolism of, the, of Mitzrayim, which is the idea that all life is to try to free ourselves from the trap of a monotony and the structures that keep us so limited. In a sense, all mitzvahs, all Torah mitzvahs is connected to the idea of freeing ourselves from more, the moral boundaries of existence. So, for instance, when we say, Ein l'cha ben cherin el amisha esig betara, the Mishnah says that there's no person that is free except the one that studies Torah. Interestingly, it doesn't say that everyone who studies Torah is free. But it says you can't be free without it. Why? Because as long as a person is made up of all the mortal forces of this universe, in a sense our own subjectivity traps us and we remain limited, as many philosophers argue, that the highest a person can reach is only as much as uh, what is humanly possible. So we can reach fame, power, money, but only that which is human. And the Torah tells us that's not so, that a human being can also touch heaven. And you can touch the divine. And you can touch immortality. If you um, free yourself of your ego and your own self-interest, and you can dedicate yourself to a higher vision, which is essentially what the Torah is, a higher vision that is not our own, one that is given to us by our, it's called the cosmic engineer, that allows a person to achieve a form of transcendence emancipation. So you could say that's essentially what the significance of what happened when the Jews left Egypt. So in our personal lives it's our own uh, whenever we experience some form of emancipation some form of transcendence something that we call ourselves free. And that can come through uh, faith through spirituality, it can come through music and art, it can come through romance through many different ways that a person experiences this type of leaving the boundaries of so called mundane existence. And uh, then following that, 50 days later, in the, in the psychological sequence, as I'm structuring it here, um, we, we come to a point where we receive the mandate and a blueprint. The Torah is a blueprint, ultimately, of how you maintain this transcendence. It's one thing to experience transcendence, and many people have experienced it in a different fashion, and form doesn't mean that they can live by it. So the Torah gives us a full system of how you can live by it, how you can build a family, and fulfill your obligations, even in this material world, make a living and do other things and still maintain so-called higher presence in your life. Or as it says in the Torah, it's not just that you experience some transcendent uh, spiritual thing, that you must build from the material parts of your life. The temple was made out of material objects, 13, 15 different objects, gold, silver, copper, different materials, stones, wood, in the later temple, in the permanent temple in Jerusalem. And from that material world, you make a place, that a higher presence, the divine presence dwells. So essentially, every one of our homes, our lives, our work, everything we do, should essentially really ultimately become a channel for something higher. And that means, that for that you need to have a blueprint, you need to have a game plan. 
It's not enough just to have a spiritual inspiration. So that's, in a sense, the sequence from the leaving of Egypt to the receiving of the Torah. Okay, all fine and good till now. Problem is, of course, as we all know, it's not so simple. That would be very nice. Each of us frees ourselves from mundane limitations. We experience transcendence, and then we build a blueprint, and, uh, and we follow a blueprint, and we live a life of, of utter happiness. How come it doesn't work? Because we have plenty of resistance. Because God made it very difficult. Because he took your soul, and my soul, and all of us, and put it into a trap, trapped into a material world, and with all our faith, and with all that we may be aware of, and at times really feel inspired, self-interest, the temptations of the moment, Money, ego, power, whatever it is, uh, w w wanting to be accepted, wanting to be honored, wanting to be uh, respected, all that and more tends to blind us. And we become focused on our own immediate lives. Uh, even at the expense that our philosophical, philosophical side may say there's something bigger and deeper. So even the person of highest presence in this world still has to struggle. Yeah, we're not talking about now that tzaddikim, great people who may have destroyed or killed their evil inclination. We're talking about people like ourselves. And that's where everything gets troublesome. So Moses is up on the mountain. What it means in our psychological terms, yes, our soul is on the mountain. But down on earth, uh, there's trouble in paradise, as they say. And the trouble is that the Jews build a false god. What it means in psychological, personal terms, simply we start worshipping something else. It could be anything. It could be money. It can be ego. It can be anything that that is anything outside of God. When they say Avodah Zarah, the expression is used is what does Avodah Zarah really mean? It means a foreign service. That's what it means. Avodah Zarah means to serve something that is zarloi, that is strange to you, a strange type of service. Instead of serving the ultimate reality, that is God, you create something else and replace it with something else. It's, not a, it's considered to be the gravest of all sins. Why? Not because God is jealous. If God was secure, what does he care? So they want to bow down to rocks and, and, and trees or want to worship the sun and the moon. So big thing. People want to be foolish. Fine. Because it's, nothing about, it's not about God. It's about us. Because once you replace God with something else, really it's an extension of self-worship. And if you're, self -worship, you're worshiping yourself, there's no way you can have a God in your life. That's why the Talmud says that uh, God says, I and an arrogant person cannot dwell under one canopy. Because there's no room for two, basically. If it's your ego and your interests, there really isn't much room for another entity. Not even a God, even an entity, another human being, then also becomes negligible and an extension of your own needs. And definitely God. So that's why when the Jews built the golden calf, it wasn't like a small little thing. It wasn't like, oh, they forgot and they transgressed Shabbos or something, or they... they, they you know, this was like the fundamental core of the whole purpose, that you are dedicating your life either to me or to yourself. Which one is it? You can't do both. So this betrayal was a major event. But what it means in our own personal lives, we all betray at some point even our own faith. There's no person that has not betrayed themselves in one way or another. You know, the whole idea, with the, when we say the word idealism, the mere word idealism means that it's an ideal beyond you. None of us live up to our highest ideals. We try to. We hope we, can, we, we attempt to but, to, but we're not always there. So in one way or another, losing one's innocence in life is similar to the golden calf. It actually says that there's a piece of the golden calf sin in every sin that exists. Is a, there's a piece of the echet egel. So this next step is when Moses comes down after 40 days in our own lives it's okay, we may have experienced transcendence and then received the mandate, a blueprint, how to live our lives. But then comes the betrayal. Then comes the loss, the break. In, in personal relationships, think of it where you fall in love with someone. Everything's going well. You're ready to build a life and there's a betrayal in one form or another. So now what happens next? And what happens next is critical because now it can go one or two ways. Either it's broken and it will not be fixed and will just continue to deteriorate the relationship or something will be changed. And Moses, of course, the ultimate man of faith, was not afraid of the break. Actually, he's the one that broke the tablets. In order to preserve, that's why he broke. He broke the tablets in order to, as the Rashi says, he tore up the contract, the ksuba. 
So he told the God, he could say to God, listen, they heard from you to not build a golden calf. Do not build a false gods. But they didn't sign the contract yet. The equivalent of signing the contract would be to receive the tablets. They didn't receive them yet because Moses was still on the mountain when it all happened. Now he comes down from the mountain and instead of get, delivering it to the Jews, he breaks them on the, on, the, on the foot of the mountain. This wasn't just because he got angry and he, he just threw them out of his hand. Moses was a little more controlled than that. It was quite deliberate because now he said to God, they never received it. So in a sense, they read the contract, they heard the contract, but they didn't technically receive it. All in order what to preserve this nation. And then he marches up again. So here comes the next stage, the stage of reconciliation. And it takes a long time. It took 40 days for Moses to receive the Torah and the law, but it took 80 days to get forgiveness. Think about that, double time. So it takes 40 days to build something, but it takes 80 days to fix it after it's broken. Double. And this is the story of our lives. Think of your life. What are we busy with most of the time? We're trying to either fix or in some way to um, get beyond things that are not uh, perfect in our lives. And this is the story of those four, uh, 80 days, all the way up to Yom Kippur. The story of this reconciliation. And Moses does prevail, as we s declared three times the night of Yom Kippur, right after Kol Nidre. That God said, I have forgiven them as you have asked me. As you stated, as Moses demanded and requested and implored of God, God forgives. So ultimately Moses does prevail. And that's itself a fascinating story of its own, how God kept saying no and how a man can prevail over God. But that is the story of Yom Kippur. That Moses came back with the most important thing of all. Not just a new set of tablets. He came back with hope. Hope that no matter what happens, even such a grave sin, that they basically betrayed God himself and all that they committed to, yet it could be fixed. And there's hope, which means that there's hope for all of us, no matter what your situation is. And this can be applied to everybody, from the worst situation to subtle problems that some of us have. I mean, we all have our own struggles. No one's in the same place. So the story goes like that. So now the question is, so what happens now after Yom Kippur? So it says in the Zohar that the two halves of the month of Tishrei are actually referred to, alluded to, in a uh, verse in the, in the book of uh, Song of Songs, Song of Song, Shir Shirim, which says, Smeli tachas l'reshi v'yemincha tachap keni, which means your left arm is under my head, and your right arm embraces me. So the Zohar says that the left arm refers to the first half of the month, and the right arm refers to the, right, the second half of the month. What is the difference between them? Uh, the, left, the left arm represents what we call Yomim Naraim. Naraim means awesome days. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, though they're not uh, sad days, but there are days where joy is muted to a certain extent. There's days you're standing, whether you call it judgment or accountability or uh, uh, awe, but definitely not days of just unbridled joy. Rosh Hashanah has its written in the book of life. Yom Kippur is sealed in the book of life. Maybe see what kind of days they are. Shofar. There's a day that you, we go in with respect, and especially Yom Kippur, is actually with a lot of humility and silence and all that Yom Kippur brings to the table. So when you stand before a king, you stand before God himself, so there's a measure, even if you internally you're happy because you have the honor and the privilege to stand before the master of the universe, still, you don't just start making t somersaults and dancing and, and screaming and yelling in joy because there's a certain... Uh, it's a vigilu berada is the expression. That the joy is, is somewhat couched and packaged in awe. So when you stand in awe, for example, of nature, you also may have joy. But there's also a moment of awe where you're like, not, I don't call the word frozen, but there's a certain element of modesty where you don't just dance and jump. However, when you leave the presence of the master, of the king, of the moment of awe, then you begin dancing in a real way and singing. 
and completely unbridled fashion, what are you singing and dancing? You're basically singing and dancing on what you just experienced. So the way it's explained is that sukkahs and its simcha, because that's the essential message of sukkahs is joy, is the revelation and the celebration of what we just experienced in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur more in, in an awesome type of fashion. It's like leaving the presence. It's not completely leaving the presence of the king, but it's not like it is Yom Kippur when you're in the Holy of Holies. When the high priest went into Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies as, as awesome and as powerful as experience, he didn't sing and dance there. He stood in, he stood in modesty, in silence, served, said a few, a few prayers, and then and walked out quietly. Because when you're in that place, actually silence is the most appropriate type of service. But then, a few days later, begins a celebration of what you just experienced. And it's act that itself is actually quite an interesting exercise in discipline. You know, there are many things in our lives, sometimes when you dance, when you should be standing in awe, are there other people who stand in awe when they should be dancing? Like they say there's some shuls, no shuls are perfect. Some shuls, whenever I go to the Kabbalah shul, I always open up this uh, line. Uh, that I was, uh, always makes me smile. And that is that there's some shuls where Rosh Hashanah looks like Simchus Torah, and some shuls where Simchus Torah looks like Rosh Hashanah. Um, and some shuls where Simchus Torah looks like Tisha B'Av, actually. We won't get into that. That's another story. So, so I guess in this world we don't have a perfect situation, so wherever every shul that br has broken so many hearts and everything is so serious and guilty and uh, filled with neurosis and phobias, so I guess there's one shul in the world they were, they're dancing all the time, even when there should be a little more, uh, you know, a little more year, they have too much av, as they say. So love, in a relationship, you also need these two balances. The balance. You need, when you love somebody, love doesn't just mean you're constantly close and, and, and one with another person. Love also means respect for another person's boundaries. The people that love each other most don't become annihilated, their identities, as a result of the love. The identities remain intact, yet there's something that's greater. So in love too, there's moments of closeness, physical closeness, and there are times when each person needs to be in their little space. As one rabbi once said, that when you're close, when you should be distant, you'll be distant when you should be close. And this is true with friends, and this is definitely true with spouses. There's a, there's a, love doesn't just mean that everybody's everywhere all the time. There's also respect of people's individuality. Each person has something to give that the other person doesn't have. It's almost like a true relationship needs love and also a measure of awe. I don't know if the right word awe of your partner is the right word, but you know what I mean. It's not just towards respect, certain respect even for the distance. And distance here, I don't mean distance in a negative sense. I mean distance in terms of, of, uh, of boundaries. So... This, this, this balance of these two sides of the coin that I'm describing, the rough first half of the month and the second half of the month, is essentially, so after all that happened, the break and the betrayal, and finally the reconciliation, so once the, when the reconciliation happens, you stand modestly. As a matter of fact, the Medrash says that the first time God gave the two tablets, it was done in pomp and circumstance. You read the Bible, what it says. It was with full fireworks. There was lightning and there was thunder and they heard sounds, they, they saw sounds, and they heard sights. It's a whole, uh, it was a whole uh, light and sound show on Sinai. And it says, because of that, you know, sometimes when you receive something with so much noise, it's like it elicited a certain type of taking for granted. I don't know if the word arrogance is appropriate, but it definitely, a certain pompousness. And so it says that the second tablet, God says, this time, let's do it with modesty. No noise, very quietly. Dave Yom Kippur, it's a holy day, it's a quiet day, no fireworks. It's also not to elicit a type of what we call Ayn Hara. You make a lot of noise, you celebrate, and say, hey, I, as if you deserve it, so anyone else can come and say, hey, you don't really deserve it. You do it in silence, and it's quieter. In a way, it's like more modest, and it arouses less attention from, they call it Tzadche Keneget, from the avenging angels. So Yom Kippur is done in that fashion. However, that doesn't mean there's no joy in celebration. When does the joy in celebration begin? A few days later. So we celebrate Sukkot, which leads literally in a progressive way all the way to Simchus Torah. Simchus Torah, we dance with the Torah and Simchus Torah, we're actually dancing with what happened in Yom Kippur, the receiving of the Torah. Because that's the question that's asked. You should dance Simchus Torah on Shavuos. That's when the Torah was received. 
Why are we dancing at the end of Sukkot? Shemini Atzeres. Because this is the dancing, the real dance that comes after the break. When you dance, so to speak, before anything happened, it's a nice dance, but you still don't know what would happen if there was a betrayal in between. And once there was a betrayal and there's a reconciliation, that even after it was broken, it could be fixed, you could imagine that that's an unlimited amount of dancing. And that's why Simcha's Torah is like the highest holiday in Simcha, in joy of the entire year, even more than Purim. Because this time, it's a joy that comes that even after we did things wrong, we still can fix it. So that being said, let me focus a little more on this. Yemine uh, Tchapkeni. So, like the, the, so in Shir Hashirim, things are written in a romantic language, so to speak. The Rambam, Maimonides, makes it clear that it's not talking about sorry, physical romance. It's talking about a metaphor for God and the people. Even if it manifests in, in the context of a man and a woman, husband and wife, that's still also a metaphor. Ultimately, love between humans is also a metaphor of love between the divine and the, and the human. So, using this term of Shir Hashim that the Zohar uses, and other, others as well, what you have here is the two halves of the month, the first half, until the full moon, and the second half, which is after the full moon. So right now we are now two days before Sukkot. Friday night will be the first night of Sukkot, two nights from now. And it will be a full moon. So as opposed to Batiku Bachay the Shefer Bakesa Liyem Chagenu, one of the meanings of that is you blow shofar when the moon the moon is hidden, the kesa it's hidden. So it says in some books and all the books, but kesa it's hidden on Shosh Hashanah. But that hiddenness is revealed Liyem Chagenu, which is Chag goes on the holiday of Sukkot. So Sukkot essentially is like the you can say the revelation of everything that was stored and accomplished on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. We're there, we accomplished it, but on Sukkot we express it. And it's expressed in great deep joy. And therefore, the, the left hand, which is under the head, is more of a, the left hand is more like the awe of Yom and Arayim, of an awe, the moment of where there's more awe and space, where we respect the divine, you don't just dance and uh, take it for granted. And the second half of the month, which is Yemini Techavkeni, is the right hand, Chesed, which is more revelation as opposed to Smel Gvura, which is more uh, discipline and, and judgment and, and distance. So Chesed, love, this is where we, Techavkeni, which embraces us, and that embrace is expressed in this dancing of Sukkot. Now, what does that mean more specifically in our own uh, lives? And uh, hence the the title of this class, Have You Ever Been Truly Hugged? And the eternal embrace. So what exactly techapkeni means? What does it mean, techapkeni? You mean it techapkeni. It says, with my right hand I embrace. I quoted there um, a beautiful way that one writer once expressed the power of a hug. That in the darkest moments of his life, when he was lonely and depressed in his own space, he had a memory that came to him of remembering when he was a little child. You know, as little children play around, and as once fell down on the ground, got himself uh, hurt. His knee was bleeding. His shin was uh, bruised. He was sitting. He was lying there and crying. Uh, who hasn't cried as a child falling? Nothing necessarily uh, life-threatening, but nevertheless, the cry of a child. And he remembers his father coming, raising him on and lifting him on his arms. And, and as he continued to cry, the father, his father grasp, clasping him to his chest, giving him that hug, you know, as a father or mother can do to a child when they want to, a beautiful hug. And giving the security, feeling you're completely embraced and completely being held and say everything will be all right. And this writer concludes... That was what gave him the strength to get out of even some of the darkest moments of his life. Just an example. It could be anybody could have expressed it maybe in other ways. But sometimes in simple examples like that, you can appreciate depth. So there are many ways we express love to each other. There's, of course, through a kiss. And there's a hug. 
And when I, I'm not talking necessarily in a romantic sense right now, as you see father and son here, necessarily. It's just the idea of one person holding another. In the Torah you have it also. It says, not always in the good sense of it, when Esau and, and Jacob met, they also they also hugged. And there Rashi brings both opinions, that, they, that he mean it with his full heart and not complete heart. When Laban hugged Jacob, they say he hugged him in order to be able to see if he's got any uh, precious uh, jewels. So there's other hugs as well in this world that are not necessarily in our benefit. I didn't do any research on this, but I know there's a circuit committee always waiting uh, about the, the history of a hug. Who, who was the first hug in history? But we have it definitely in the Bible. And, um, and also, you know, today, for instance, is the handshake. So I, again, didn't do any research, but I have a little theory I'll share with you. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, so be it. Um, I was thinking that maybe culturally speaking, you know, a handshake is a very, uh, really actually quite a controlling type of greeting. Because, you know, when, you're, when you press out your hand, how close you want that person near you, how far you want them, you know, you like that. A hug, on the other hand, is much more vulnerable because two people hug each other. They have to get closer, and it's not always on your terms. Even though there are those that know how to do that bear hug thing, by the time you get yourself, you know, you've already been, like, basically smothered or yeah right there are uh, bear huggers um, but nevertheless a handshake is definitely is to my mind much more an aggressive stance so we got to do a little research mark okay on the handshake versus the hug uh, greeting I do know that a salute you probably all know where a salute comes from a salute is absolutely aggressive from aggressive root a salute came from the old days when uh, soldiers would meet each other and they had their uh, iron masks, the vi visors, what are they called, visors? Visors. And uh, they would pull it open to show that they're friendly because you didn't know who was behind the mask. So, th so they did that. And that became a salute. So even when they don't use it anymore, we salute is like a salute of friendship, so to speak. You know, I'm your friend type of thing. It's an interesting thing, a salute. Since we're already into cultural uh, symbolisms, I did write an article once about this, about the salute, and what else would I, oh, about the, um, why we uh, toast each other with tipping glasses. That's definitely interesting, the root of that. That's d that due to the olden days, they used to poison <laughs> each other. So the tipping of the glasses actually was, you were, they were each pouring into each other's cup. So, you know, if, then you know you can drink it, because the guy's also going to drink from that cup. Because sometimes you poisoned your enemy. So if, you're, if it was actually the enemy, you'd do that, and they would, today, we just do it symbolically, we don't actually pour it, but that's where it comes from. So next time you greet someone and toast, basically you're saying, okay, listen, I didn't poison you. <laughs> that's what it means. And finally, also another just interesting thing for those that are follow Hasidic traditions. So with Hasidim, they wear right over left jackets and kapotis and so on. The custom generally in the Western world is left over right. The reason it's left over right is because when people wore a sword, most people were righties, and it was easier to pull out a sword when you had a left over right jacket than a right over left. And the reason the Hasidim wear right over left is because Chesed should always dominate over Gvur. Right is, that's why I asked you whether you move from right to left or left. Okay, so now you're on the right side, my right side at least. The complicated part is that when I look at you, your right side is your left side. So that's another thing, a mirror image issue. But anyway, so since we're ready into this... Uh, Trivia. You may not know why you came here tonight. Maybe just to pick up some little trivia that you can share next time. You need some uh, small talk, you know, elevator uh, conversation. Besides talking about the weather, you can just say, hey, did you know, you know. Uh, so, Meaningful Life Center offers all kinds of interesting uh, bits of wisdom. <laughs> um, so, uh, getting back to uh, a more serious note, our theme here. So the, the issue of, uh, I forgot already where I was up to, the hug. Oh, okay. Again, off this, on a tangent. Um, if you ever study Talmud, by the way, you start studying Talmud, that's exactly what happens. It's like this uh, spontaneous discussion, and suddenly they're off a completely different subject that they began with. This is very common. Um, so back to the hugging topic. Uh, on, a, on a healthy level, a hug is actually two people embracing but the hug, is like in the context that I described before with the father and the child, which is the first places we're really hugged are by our parents. That's our first hugs in life. Is essentially, without words, 
the best expression that you're using your body, your arms, your, your entire body, to engulf, to surround another person and assure them, reassure them that they sh everything is all right, everything is safe, that I'm here, I'm here to hold you. And even after you let go, that memory remains with you and you know that that person is there for you. Should you need that again, you can come back for another hug. So, when you say, V'yemini techabkeni, which is, as I said, a verse in Shir Hashirim, and it refers to the sukkahs, the first thing that it elicits, of course, where in sukkahs do we find a hug? So the answer is given, that is the sukkah itself. That when we walk in for the first time, on the holiday night in the sukkah, so even though it's silent in a certain way, it's a silent hug, you're being surrounded by a, a holy um, abode that has a certain holiness to it. And uh, to quote even, uh, what does it say, when a man sits in the shadow, sukkah of the shadow of faith, tzel ha-shechina, tzel ha the shechina spreads its wings from him from above. That's what it says in the Talmud. Which really means that the sukkah is symbolic of a of a, of a cosmic hug. It completely surrounds us. Yes, it doesn't uh, crush us. You may not feel it closing in. That wouldn't be a nice, interest, that would be interesting sukkah that closes in. Actually, it's not a kosher sukkah. But the idea is that if you think about it, and uh, with a schach on top, you know, a sukkah is a portable shack, just to explain its description, which means it has to be something that is portable, something that's not permanent, it can be a permanent structure. And one of the elements of it has to be a, a ceiling, a roof, that is not made of anything solid, or any type of solid thing. It has to be made out of vegetation. So people use bamboos, evergreens, anything. You can't have a tree that's growing over it. You can't have anything blocking it. It's between, in other words, nothing could be blocking from you to heaven. So in a sense, it's like the sukkah is a way like you're connecting to heaven, but it's encompassed. It's not just sitting outside in the street. You're surrounded by something. And it's actually symbolic. One of the reasons for sukkah is symbolic of the Anani covered, the clouds of glory that actually surrounded the Jews when they left Egypt. And it protected them. Those clouds, the Torah says clearly, were protection. So that's where the, that, that hug originates from. So the sukkah actually is, in a sense, like those clouds of glory. Some say, in some books it says, that the sukkah is Anani covered, like the clouds, originate from the Anan Hakteris that were offered from the incense and the, and the uh, what can say, incense released a certain smoke and vapor, that vapor of the Anan Hakteris becomes the power that uh, empowers the Sukkot's uh, so-called um, clouds. So all this symbolic of idea of an embrace. And it's interesting even to describe it this way because you go into a Sukkot, so there's a certain coziness, you sit with your family, especially if it isn't raining, uh, uh, I come from a custom where you eat in a sukkah even when it rains. That's why I'm saying that. Not everyone does. And it definitely is certain coziness, especially if the weather is perfect. What would you say is the right perfect weather for sukkahs? <laughs> you haven't figured that out? I'm asking the experts back there. <laughs> the perfect, uh, like, 65 degrees, right? Something like that. <laughs> yeah? Maybe you get a little cold. 68 it's a thermostat the type of thing. Um, so there's a certain pleasant coziness, especially the first night before you get used to it. Um, and, but, but on a deeper level, it's a great way of even envisioning the power of it. Now, of course, there are many reasons of a sukkah. One of the reasons is even to demonstrate that security doesn't necessarily come from our built man-made structures. That you can live in a home which is not so secure. A sukkah is not exactly a very secure place. And yet it can give you more security than your physical structure. Uh, we've seen that. I think I wrote about it, I remember, after September 11th. We saw then that our physical structures are not necessarily the most secure place to be. In the times when the Jews left Egypt and God surrounded them with a, a clouds of glory, it was a, me it was a message that ultimately security comes from a divine place, not from a physical place. In the context of the hug, it means that what really will give a person most security in this world? If you had to choose between and hopefully we never would have to choose, but that's just for argument's sake, between parents who had money but didn't give you love and did not embrace you unconditionally, and parents who embraced you unconditionally but didn't leave you any money, which would you choose? Actually, I better not ask that question. You know what I, 
But, huh? What? How much money? Right, that's the question. Because, <laughs> of course, people, I'll tell you why they don't want to, because people will say, listen, give me the money and I'll go buy myself some hugs and embraces. But anyone that has tried to do that knows it doesn't really work. Um, the point is, I'm not trying to suggest you have to choose. God, God should bless us all, we should have both. And they're definitely both a blessing. My point was really just to make the contrast. Because let me put it this year this way. If you did not, God forbid, a person, did not, a child did not have a, a parent, parents that hugged and embraced them unconditionally, your whole life you're busy searching for that. And you're spending a lot more money than they would have ever given you just to find that love. That's how it is. Because what a child gets in those embraces, especially at a young age, is immeasurable. To the point you can't, we can't even estimate what its power is. You only see it's actually its power when, when, when one is deprived of it. People who have it don't even appreciate it necessarily. If you don't have it, you realize that something that fundamentally is missing. So the, the idea of sukkahs is to teach us, um, firstly, that even if your parent didn't hug you, there's, there's still someone that does. God, of course, and sukkahs is symbolic of that. So Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, the message there, is actually almost the other way around. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is what we do for God, so to speak. That we reach to God, we acknowledge a higher presence in awe, through shofar, through tshuva, return, through our prayers, through fasting. I mean, a lot of work. If you're really going to do Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, right, it's not an easy thing to do. In a sense, it's how we reach upward. It's really the difference between Smail and Yamin, as I'll explain in a moment, between left and right. Sukkot is what's called the Hamshachet. So let me explain that for a moment. In, in the Jewish thought, uh, when you think about, in general, the Jewish structure, there's what's called ha, ha, two new words, hala and hamshach. Well, hala means when you reach upward. You initiate, and God responds. Hamshach means when God initiates, and you respond. In, uh, in Hasidic and in Zohar language, there's a thing called and a sarusa de latata, an awakening that comes from below. And there's a sarusa de leila, which is an awakening that comes from above. Sometimes in Kabbalistic terms, it's halas man, amshach is mad, mayin nukfin, mayin tchurin, for those that are more familiar with this uh, jargon. But what it means in, in our personal lives is, if you recall, I spoke about it a few weeks ago, in the month of Elul. So Elul is an acronym for Anila Daidi. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. So you have there really the secret of all relationships, that it's a, a reciprocal relationship. There's sometimes I reach to my beloved, and sometimes my beloved reaches to me. But there, the beginning is I, I initiate first, and then the li. There's actually another verse in the Song of Songs where it goes the other way around. It says, V'daydili v'aniloi. That my beloved reaches to me and then I to him. Actually, in the in Zohar and in other books, it talks about that that's more like the experience during Nisan, Passover, where there it began that God took the Jews out of Egypt and then the Jews reached backward, reached, reached back through counting the Omer and then receiving the Torah. But Tishrei and Elul and Tishrei works the other way around. First, we initiate. So Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is an initiation primarily from below. It doesn't mean there is nothing happening from above. Many things are happening. There's a new light, a new energy enters the universe. But the primary work is one of halal, which means that we reach up, upward. It's through our prayers, through our initiation, through our efforts, through our uh, atonement or our accountability. But the second half of the month is what's called hamshacha, which is where now God responds. And it comes from up from the upward down. So it begins with a sukkah. And a sukkah, though we build it, but ultimately, as I just said, it's the shekhinah spreading its wings and surrounding us in an embrace. So the first thing that sukkah tells us is that all of us are embraced unconditionally. It makes no difference who it is. It's interesting, you could even say that a person may not even know what a sukkah is, and there are some that don't. It says when other Jews walk into a sukkah, the embrace extends even to those that don't know what a sukkah is. Some places it says, Ruin kol Yisrael leishev b'sukkah achas, that all the Jewish people are worthy of sitting in one sukkah. In other words, it's a collective embrace besides a personal one. So the first thing we should all know is that we are embraced this way, 
unconditionally. And no matter what happened yesterday, no matter even how Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur went, Sukkot comes and we have that Hamshacha, so to speak. We have that revelation. It doesn't end there, as you'll see, but that's where it begins. Now, what exactly is an embrace, the physical concept of an embrace? So the way the Kabbalists explain it, like everything in this material world evolves from a spiritual place. It doesn't first begin that we live in a physical realm and then we look for spiritual metaphors. It begins actually the other way around. Think of it like um, what comes first, feeling sad in your heart or tears out of your eyes? So anyone knows, of course, first you feel sad, then you cry. Does the smile come on your face first and then you start feeling happy? Or first there's a sense of happiness and then you smile? So in other words, physical manifestations always follow a cause. That may not be so physical. That may be more sublime. So the way the Kabbalists put it in a more general sense is the entire universe is that way. When it rains outside, so we take out an umbrella or a raincoat, meteorologists will tell us it's due to pressure systems and, and whatever, highs and lows. Um, and mystics will tell you that when it rains outside, it's no different than the tears of a human being. Maybe it's the angels crying. Or maybe it's a type of uh, spiritual tear. So the way the mystics explain all the physical phenomena is that first it begins on a spiritual level, and then it evolves into a physical one. So if you want to understand the metaphor, the meaning of a physical hug, why it has such power, potency, why does it comfort us? Why does a child feel secure when a, when a f father or mother hugs him or her? It's because there's a thing called a spiritual hug, which of course is a sukkah hug. What's a spiritual hug? So to understand, techapkeni, we look at the physical, and from there we can extrapolate and understand what would be a spiritual hug. So what's the opposite of a hug? Anybody? What's the opposite of a hug? A punch? I don't know. Pushing away somebody, right? Shoving someone away. Like if somebody wants to come close to you, they'll push you away. It could be physical, it could be, it could also be uh, body language. So this is the way it's understood, this Tichabkeni idea. Um, we, all say, we all say in the Shema, we said it Yom Kippur many times, especially at the high point on the Ila, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. That God is one, indivisible, Echad. And the Talmud says Echad is an acronym for Aleph, which is oneness, Alufish Lelam, God. Ches is the seven heavens and the earth, eight. And Dalad is the four sides of the world, east, west, north, and south. That all the different um, duplicity, uh, not duplicity, the multiplicity of the universe is all encompassed in the, under one Echad. So Echad is not like Yochid in Hebrew. You know, Yochid is a word in Hebrew which means a singularity. Echad means that there's not a singularity. It's a world full of multiplicity. And yet, it's all pieces of one large oneness. So when we say monotheism, that Abraham was the, first, was the founder of monotheism. Most people simpl simplistically think that before Abraham, there were many gods. There were idols and, and people had many gods. Paganism. Whether it's duality or multipl multiplicity, plurality. And Abraham acknowledged there's only one God. If you think about it, what does that mean exactly? One God instead of many gods. Much deeper than that. Hashem Echad doesn't just mean there's one God and not many gods. It means there's one reality and not more than one reality. That means it's not just one God somewhere up in heaven, that all of existence is an extension of divine unity. Now that's a major statement. That means no matter what you see, no matter what, how blind we are and how myopic our vision is, we're, we're, we only see little pieces of a big picture. So we declare Hashem Echad, and we cover our eyes when we do it, which is symbolic of like, shutting down your eyes and your senses that see a fragmented universe, to closing out the world that we see, and acknowledging with our minds, our hearts, our souls, that there's a higher unity, that everything is 
encompasses everything. Now, interestingly, this is fundamental Jewish thought. This is the most famous prayer, Shema Echad. It goes all the way back to Abraham, what Abraham came to discover. That's why he, 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 he first thought God is not on earth, maybe the sun, maybe the moon. But then he came to realize all of existence cannot be God because they're all parts, pieces and parts. And there has to be something that's beyond it all, that unites it all. So monotheism in that sense is a whole other meaning of that type of higher unity. What's fascinating is that just recently, in the last hundred years, literally, last century, this concept of an inherent unity that connects all the universe became popular science. Modern physics, quantum mechanics, is essentially that idea, the search for the inherent unity. Some even call it the search for unified field theory. What is unified field theory? One law, one constant, one law that would unify all the laws, and that still has not been found. Einstein tried, they're still trying. It's like the ultimate holy grail of physics, of science, to find the unified field theory. Now, how they convince that it exists? Very simple, because all of science is a search for unity. If you cut science down to the bare core of it, what is it really? It's looking at the, looking at the diverse multitudes of phenomena in the universe and trying to find a few laws that can explain multiple phenomena. That's really what science ultimately is. And when you find that law, you can learn to manipulate the universe for better of our lives. That's why essentially science is one with technology, which is one with unity. What does technology ultimately do? It unites us. Telephones, we can connect to anyone across the world. Today with the internet, communications. It's really trans it's basically uh, trans trans it's transcending time and space. That's what technology really does. It, f it teaches us that there's a force that connects us even though we're separate. So a little while ago, and even today if you really think about it, it still remains miraculous to most of us, to all of us. You could actually sit in front of a tube, a television, and see live an event that's happening a million miles away, a thousand miles away. Think of it for a moment. Once upon what is inconceivable, time and space separated us. What happened in Australia did not get here to New York until somebody reported it, and it could have taken days or weeks or months or maybe never reached here. And now these things are simultaneous. Obviously, with the, with the, uh, with the spaceships going into out, to the outer space, so it may take time till the transmissions reach here, but literally, for, I don't know, they say even hundreds of millions of miles away, what, uh, what spaceships are right now ready by Uranus or wherever they are out there? They're still sending messages here and pictures and all that stuff. What is it? Not Explorer. Um, what is this? We all forgot about it. It happened so long ago when they were launched, like 20 years ago. The point is that there... So what is actually happening here? So we may not fully understand what's happening, but one thing is for sure. Science has, has dug beneath the surface of the differences of time and space and found out that there's forces at work, whether it's electrical forces, whether it's electromagnetic, whether it's subatomic particles, that if you tap into them, you can suddenly connect time and space like we can now. So it's not like uh, we think that there's a little human being inside your television, because how do you get here, you know? And uh, so was some way of manipulating airwaves, sound waves, what are airway sound waves? There's something that connects us all. And even without wires. Obviously, you, need a, you may need a wire. But we know today with wireless, cellular, there's all kinds of ways of transmitting. It's really tapping into forces that are, that are unified. And that's why we can see and hear and access things that are completely not in our proximity. This, in essence, is really what science is about. The search for unity. <coughs> So it's not just amazing, it's basically the essence of Judaism, Hashem Echad. It's not a new concept, it's not a rabbinic concept, it's straight from the Bible. And it goes back, excuse me, to Abraham, who discovered that there's a higher unity. Okay, what does all this have to do with hugging? We'll see in a moment. Very much connected. The problem then is, and this is what all the mystics, and the sages, and all the Torah scholars all struggle with. So what happened? If there's an inherent unity that connects us all, why don't we feel it? And, and put it more bluntly, how is it possible that one person can hurt another person when they're really two parts of one whole? 
to use the analogy from the Yerushalmi, the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud. It says that we are like all organs of one body. Is it conceivable that the right hand should hurt the left hand if it does something wrong? Not in a healthy body. I mean, it's a tragedy and one of the worst diseases possible when the parts of the body turn against each other. I don't know what it's called, but there's a, it, 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 it's called cancer. I don't mean cancer. Cancer is, I think, something a little different than that, but there's something where the immune system turns on itself. It sees the organs as a threat, as a foreign uh, uh, intruder. But the point is, why is it not? Why, why? Why is that happening? Because in a healthy body, whether we understand it or not, the, your your smallest toe knows it's part of a large body, and it's not going to turn it. There's some there's some so-called coordinator that's sending messages through a whole system of your body that tells you, no matter how many billions of cells, actually we have 75 trillion cells in the human body. 75 trillion cells. That something is telling all those 75 trillion cells you're part of one thing and don't hurt each other. Even though they're far apart and not only that, they function differently. Some cells and some parts of the body need certain minerals to function and actually other minerals are not so healthy for them. There are other parts of the body that need other minerals. And there's, just, there's something with, with all the diversity in the human body is also a unifying factor that makes it one. We're not a sum of the parts. There's some, we, you're one person, one body, with all its uh, diversity. And it is fascinating how diverse it is, this small little human body. I mean, the same, Elam Cotton Zah, Adam, the same is true for the larger universe. That the symmetry of the universe is the same thing. As diverse as it is, there's some type of messages that tells the universe and every component of it, you're part of one thing. And you see how, the, how it works, the whole ecological balance of the universe in the most fascinating way how if plankton in one part of the earth one, sea, one ocean who knows uh, hundreds, thousands of miles away erode for some reason is going to affect the fishing going on here in New York Har in the East Coast Harbor because it's all it's, it's, the, it's the food chain that has about a food chain you know, how, you know how long a food chain can be it can be two, three hundred <coughs> links in that chain that have no connection to each other to the visible eye that's all over the universe, all over the earth. So this, we all know that, well, we know at least some of this symmetry, and it's constantly, it, it always amazes us when we see it, and it's not just on earth, it's the, the interaction of the atmosphere and the cloud structures and, and outer space and the winds and so on. It all adds up. It's only the human being that can actually screw it up, basically. Take out the human being from the equation, and it's like a clock with all its balances and and even hurricanes and earthquakes and tsunamis and so on are also part of the balance. It's only if there are humans there, it can be a disaster area. But if there were no earthquakes, and you know every five seconds they say there's an earthquake somewhere on Earth, mostly underwater. If there were no earthquakes and no volcanoes, we would not be here. It's very much part of creating life in this world. And the oxygen and all the balance that's necessary. But, the, but beyond that, so the question, the big dilemma is, as I said, so what happened? Why is this unity not apparent to us? Why don't we live in peace? Why don't we just simply see each other as pieces of one large entity? Which would be, make life very simple. There would be no discord. You know, we could have differences of opinions. Listen, different parts of the body also clamor for a different attention. Yet they come to peace. They, they, they know they're all, it's, all, it's in all their interest to, to find a solution. So why is it the human race is not that way? Why don't we see this unity? So different thinkers, talking on a Jewish level, tried to resolve this in many different ways. Ultimately, each explanation was inadequate. It's ultimately the great Arizal, the holy Arizal, Isaac Luria in the 16th century, that revealed what we call the Seyed HaTzimtzum, the secret of the Tzimtzum. I've discussed this many times. Basically, that in some mysterious way, the divine force, God, conceal the divine presence and in this great concealment compared to a teacher concealing his wisdom when you're teaching a, a, say a, new, a, a kindergarten child so the teacher cannot just say everything he or she knows you have to conceal most and just reveal a bit that concealment essentially allowed us to exist had God not concealed that unity we would not be able to exist as individuals or as Arizal puts it in Eitz Chaim in his of life, classic, all written by the way by his student Rabbi Chaim Vital, 
but it's his teachings. He says essentially that in the beginning, he doesn't mean in time, conceptually, Eren Sof, the divine infinite light, encompassed everything and then con- concentrated or contracted the light, leaving a space. All this is metaphorical. As I said, think of it as a teacher who takes all his ideas and puts them aside to just leave a space so the student can learn A, B, C, D, or whatever it is that you're spoon-feeding the child. And co- completely, co- completely concealed the presence. Had he not concealed it, the Rizal says, nothing would be able to exist, nothing would be able to emerge. Think again of the analogy. If a teacher would just pour out all his brilliance to students, and they, they would not have the containers, they'd be completely confused, they'd be completely overwhelmed by all this information. So a big part of education is not just what you transmit, it's what you don't transmit. It's what you withhold. That's also just another lesson as well, as well in love and in communication. Not only what you say, it's what you don't say. And this is true across the board. For example, on a, anyone knows design of basic printing design, more white space on a page than black space. So the letters are the black space, but the white space is more important to keep the symmetry. So what you don't what you don't reveal is even more important than what you do reveal. Megala tefach mechaset vachayim is the expression. You reveal one inch, but you conceal two. So in that sense, in that sense, God through concealing allowed the revelation, the emergence of us as individuals. Now what happens next is the is the challenge. Do we buy into this concealment and say, hey, I'm here, I'm a self-made man or woman. I don't really need or care about anybody else. Or do you come to realize, hey, you know, there's really a deeper unity behind all of this. And for me to exist, it had to be concealed from my eyes. And now I re- try to retrieve it and reconnect it. And that's why we say the Shema. We're basically saying I don't buy into the delusion of a, multi- of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, of a um, plurality. But I do understand there's a deeper unity that connects it all. So scientists perhaps discover it in the world of science and technology. That doesn't mean scientists necessarily are more loving and more unifying human beings than the rest of us. Just as a footnote. Um, because when it comes down to it, once selfish interest gets into, the, into play, we conveniently, it's easier to gravitate to, your, to, to a fragmented universe than a united one. But basically the, all the search of life is to find that unity. So now let's go back to the hug and children and so on. If you recall a few weeks ago when it was Elul, I spoke about that we all begin our lives submerged in the embryonic waters of uh, nine months of pregnancy. Completely hugged. You could say a sukkah for nine months, if you wish. Not quite exactly like a sukkah, but if you know what I mean. Completely surrounded, completely provided for. All your eating, drinking, and sleeping, everything is done, Teshvu came to Duru in the mother's womb. And everything is protected there. And if you recall, one of the reasons given for this is because before we get into a world, a cruel world, a hostile world, a world of loneliness and separation where we all are part, God gives us nine months to give us the power to be submerged in a unified place. Now, as I mentioned, Elam Katan Adam, the small universe. The human being is a small universe, and the large universe is reflected in our small lives. The universe also began that way. If you read the beginning of the Torah, it says, Bereshit, God created the heaven and earth, and then only on the second day did he separate the higher waters and the lower waters. So all the commentaries explain, because the universe was submerged, Mayim by Mayim, was completely submerged in water. And the divine spirit hovered above the water. Now, if God was going to create land, and it, was, and it was important for the purpose of creation that there be land, and it happened at day two, and later he would create creatures, on the, well, first vegetation, then creatures, and then a human being, why begin, why waste time? He created the universe anyway, create land and create water, and that's it. Why first all submerged in water, then he has to separate it? I mean, the creator is a creator. Like the guys, like the people that ask, why did God need six days to create the universe? Frankly, if you can't create a universe, even six days won't help you. And if you could create one, you can do it in a second. Right? So the answer given for that question, by the way, is also in the Zohar. 
It doesn't say b'sheishis yamim, that God created the universe in six days. It says sheishis yamim. God created six days. Because the structure of creation, time itself is a creation, and six and seven is the structure of time. So God created six dimensions in existence. That's why there are six days. It wasn't God needed six days. There were no days altogether. He created six dimensions, and then a seventh, which are the seven emotions and so on, chesed, gur, teferis. And that's why the universe is made up of a structure. So the reason that God created... Why, so why didn't He just create land? The answer is because, like what it is with a child, before creating land, where people would be disconnected from their source, as opposed to fish in the sea, that always feel connected, which is why dogim, loy boy shechita, fish do not need the same type of shechita slaughtering as animals do, <coughs> because they're pure, they're like a mikveh. There's even an opinion that if you go into the sea in a mikveh, you know, there's a thing called a chatzitza, you're not supposed to have anything that blocks between you and the water. What happens if a fish touches you? Is that considered to be blocked? So there's Rav Shimon ben Gamliel, there's an opinion that says fish are like water. So if a fish touches you, it's just like water touching you, and that's not considered to be a impediment. Not, there's another opinion, not that way, but it just shows you that fish have a certain type of ethereal nature, which is why we eat fish before meat and, and uh, Shabbos and holidays. It's another discussion, the fish discussion. We'll, we'll do that another time. Now we're talking about hugging. So, we're going to cover it all. Fish, hugging, kisses. Um, so, ah, that's a good question. Can fish hug each other? <laughs> Jeff, any? I've never seen a fish hug each other. They don't need to hug each other, as you'll see in a moment. So, basically, the universe was also created completely submerged in water. Also, to give it a, a head start, like an injection that before the world would go into a descent and feel disconnected, God infused in it its connection to water. And you know, human beings, we gravitate to water. Beachfront property is the most expensive. So the evolutionary theorists say the reason that we gravitate to water and we like to be near water and in water and so on is because we started as amphibious creatures once. We evolved from them. Before the apes, it was amphibious creatures. Before the amphibian, it was bacteria. Uh, on Yom Kippur, I heard an interesting, nice little joke. I think I shared it by the break, where uh, Johnny comes home from school and he asks his mother, so wh where do we come from? Where does each of us come from? So she says, you come from? I had a mother and father. They had a mother and father. It goes all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. They had children, parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve, who God created in the, in the garden. A few days later, he asked his father the same question. His father says, we evolved from apes, which evolved from amphibious creatures, from bacteria, and so on and so forth. So once he had the opportunity to confront his father and mother, he says, what's going on here? You know, you say this, she says this. So his mother says, we're both right. He's, he's talking about his ancestry, I'm talking about mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... There you go. I, got, I just reconciled creationism and evolution. <laughs> Depends who you're talking to. <laughs> okay, so with that being said, um, that's what they say. And the Torah says the reason we gravitate to water is because water is unifying. When you're in water, you feel embraced. You feel hugged. Minamaya Mishisiu, Moshe. Though he had a different name given by his parents, a Jewish name, the name that becomes associated with Moshe to the point no one even knows his other name. Which in a way you could say is an insult to Yechevid and Amram. They gave birth to Moshe, they gave him a name. Yet the name that remains with Moshe is the name that Pharaoh's daughter gave to him when she drew him out of water. So everyone, why? What kind of, what, what, what kind of what statement is that? Why? What is so significant as being drawn out of water? Some incident that happened, he was hidden in the basket in order to save his life. So she happened to find him, so she drew him out of water. So therefore his name remains Moshe until this day. Zichru Teres Moshe Avdi. Ba'aminu Ba'ashem Moshe Avdi. This great Moshe, the greatest man that ever lived, the man of God, is called Moshe. So the answer given is because he actually captured the essence of his soul. Moshe came from the world of water. A world that's connected to the divine. In the, worlds of the, in the words of the Kabbalists, it's called Alma Discasia, the hidden worlds where everything is like fish submerged in water. You look at the water, you don't see 
the creatures, you only see the water. And then there's Alma Dizgalia, the revealed world, where you see the creatures, everything separate. One is the world of unity, and one is the world of separation. Both are needed. But the goal is that in a world that is separated, a world of plural, plural, plurality, we should discover unity. Echad. That we should look, find the unity. And Moshe came from that world and was thrown into this world to help all of us return to that world, basically. Or better put, to bring that unity into this world. That's why in the great prophecy of Yeshaya that we say on the night last day of Pesach, Messianic prophecy, so Yeshaya, the great prophet Isaiah writes, says, There will no longer be any evil or any destruction on my holy mountain. And he gives a reason, key. Mala Arad Deus Hashem, because the world will be filled with divine knowledge. And listen to the last words he uses: Kamayim la Yom like the waters that cover the earth. Water is symbolic of Meha Dasatar. The Rambam writes, water is symbolic of the divine, of unity, and the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. So everyone asks, what does it have to do with destruction? Why will there be no more destruction? And evil because the world is covered because the world is covered like the water is covered the sea with divine knowledge. You know there are many people you see have divine knowledge and they're very destructive. <clears throat> and the answer given is because if it's truly divine knowledge, knowledge das not just chachma bin, but it's connected. It's a unity, and once there's unity, there's no room for evil or injustice or hurting each other, because then we feel we're all part of one entity. Those that still can hurt is proven that they're not so divine knowledge. They may have knowledge, but it may not be so divine. So the point is that we all begin our lives in a hug. And the ultimate hug is like, like water itself. Which is why sukkah is, is also connected to water. It's a celebration of water. Simchas Besa She'eva. Which means it's a celebration that we begin the time of the temple as they carried and they, they, they gathered. She'eva, they drew the water. V'shaf Tamayim As they drew the water that would be poured over the altar in the, in the daily service of the temple, they celebrated on sukkahs. Because water, sukkah, is all part of that chesed, the love of the embrace of something that connects us. So what is a hug, the power of a hug? The power of a hug in its spiritual sense is a connecting force in a world where things are not connected. So when that father picked up his little boy, when any human being that loves another person and embraces them, what he was showing him was, though the world can be a hostile place, and you may have fallen and gotten hurt, and there may be other challenges in life that will hurt you, know that I'm connected with you, and we're connected. So it's ultimately unity that gives us strength to overcome every challenge. That's really what a hug does. So in the physical sense, yes, it manifests of one body clasping or embracing another. But in the, what its real meaning is that, there, that you're not separate. We, there's something we can we give each other strength. We can carry each other. We can uh, lift each other to another place. You know, the, the antithesis of it is when the prophet Yirmiyahu, when he says, on the saddest day of the year, in Tisha B'av, we repeat it, the opening of the book of Echa, Lamentations. It says, Echa Yashva Badad. Woe! That she sits alone. Yirmiyah, of all the things that he opens up, the saddest book about the most tragic event in Jewish history, in its root, you know, the Holocaust may have been more uh, in a sense of numbers and so on, but the root of all tragedy was, he says, not the temple was destroyed, not that people got killed, not that the Jews were exiled for, for so long until this day from Israel, that there's no longer service in the temple. You know what I mean? There's a whole list of things, of tragedies that happen. That the holy, holy of holy of holies was defiled. He says, woe that she, and the she is Jerusalem, sits alone. Now why is that the worst of all things? Why did you open with that? Because, think of it psychologically, the ch greatest challenge for a human being when we, have, when we have problems is not the problem itself, is that we feel isolated. And we feel nobody is there with us. If we sincerely and really felt that a per someone was with us, we would be able to bear a lot more than we, could, we can ever bear. The idea, pain itself, and everything that comes with that type of loss or trauma 
what it does is psychologically it makes you feel you're all alone. Nobody can, nobody understands you. Nobody is there with you. Nobody can relate to you. So what, so what Yirmiyo saw, Jeremiah saw, was yes, all the tragedies are terrible, but the loneliness is what got him. That from here on you feel you're separate, you're alone. If you knew God was with you, if you knew others were with you, you could say, you know what, it's difficult, but I know that, that I have someone here with me. No. When God later consoles the people, He says, Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami, He sends the prophets to console them. So the Avud Raham and others explain that there's a whole sequence of the seven Nechamta, the seven weeks of consolation. That the Jews say, why are you sending us prophets and messengers? You destroyed the temple, why don't you come and tell us I'm sorry? It's like, someone hurts you and then they send a messenger. Come yourself. And it's a whole dialogue back and forth and finally God says, God himself does come. So the question that can be asked is, if God is going to come anyway at the end, why did he send the prophets and he didn't understand that when you hurt somebody, come yourself and say, I'm sorry, or say, I console you? But God gave us a great gift. He said, you know what? Not only I can console you, I'm also allowing human beings to console you. People can console each other. It's a big power. Because it's not... A, it's a, to say that God can console us, that's obvious. But that human beings, we're all mortals. How could one person who suffered console another person who suffers? It's in the same boat. Ein chavish matris atzmei, it says. A person who's in fetters cannot free himself. Yet God gave us a gift and said, you visit the sick, you can help alleviate some of the sickness. It says when we visit someone that's sick, we take away one-seventieth of the sickness. As a kid, I asked my father, does that mean if you go 70 times, you get rid of the whole illness? He said, not exactly. But you could try it out. Maybe he doesn't. So we have the power to heal others. We have the power to console others. That means we have the power to unite with others. So when we hug each other and we give a hug to somebody that's in need, what you're really doing is saying that even though this world is so lonely and so separate, there is a connection. That's what that father gave power to his son. Now, of course, someone wrote to me an email today that I should discuss the issue of Shomer Nagiya in this context. But that I'm going to leave for another time. Those of you who know what I'm talking about, great. If not... We'll do a, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm the Shomer Nagiya expert, but um, anyway, if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine too. Uh, but the point that I'm making here, it still says, V'yamini techapkeni, and a sukkah is definitely not Shomer Nagiya, because it embraces everybody, uh, men and women, and anyone that enters the sukkah. So what we have here is really a message that sometimes you don't think about. You think sitting in a sukkah, I mean, there are many beautiful parts of it, and people have many lessons. But just the mere fact that there's an entity that was built, and God says, I give it power to embrace you like I embrace you in my arms, in my, spreads his wings like the wings, and uh, it is, a, is, an, is an amazing lesson in life because it means that no matter who you are and where you are, if you really allow yourself, you can discover you're not alone. You know, there's that uh, famous uh, cliche at this point of that, what is it, that poem, whatever it's called, they have on greeting cards where a guy sees his whole life in footsteps in the sand, right? The two sets of footsteps. And he sees the hardest times in his life is only one set of footsteps. So he asks God, where were you? In my hardest times, when I needed you, I don't see any footsteps. He says, well, that's when I was carrying you. So there's only one set. It's, it's God's set, not yours. You're on top. So the problem is we don't know it and we don't always sense it. That is why we have each other. That's why Sukkot, of all the holidays, is a, suk- is a holiday of guests. Besides the spiritual guests that come visit the Sukkot every night, Abraham, but it's the message that we're not alone. That's what the bottom line comes down to. Every night there's another guest. And then in the material sense of it, we invite guests. Shabbos, the mitzvah of guests, is not as dominant as on a holiday. And of all holidays, Sukkot is more than any, because Simcha, as opposed to Einik Shabbos, pleasure, Simcha is, can only be celebrated with others. You know, weddings, celebrations. We want our friends there. Yes, of course you have joy in your heart and you can stay home and just celebrate with, with one person or yourself. But, excuse me, but it's not a true joy unless it's done with others. So it's part of understanding that we are connected and that our battle in life, it comes down to it, is a simple one but also the hardest one of all. That despite the, the illusion 
or illusion or delusion that we are really pieces, fragmented pieces of a disconnected, disjointed world, we are really part of one reality. Every time a human being makes a gesture, each of us, in that direction, you fix a little part of the world. Because you fix one break that was not never meant to be there. So God's tzimtzum was meant to conceal the presence in order for us to reveal it, obviously. It was meant for us to be. Without that, there would be not, no existence. Our job is not to be deceived by that concealment and correct. So every time you have a choice, you meet somebody, you have two choices. You're either going to behave self, selfishly, narcissistically, what's good for you, and then you feed and amplify the division and the plurality of this universe. Or you're going to do a little echad, which means a little connection. That can be a gesture, it can be a nice word, it can be an invitation. It can be anything that creates a connection. So it's not just a nice thing to do. You know, we all feel good, you help somebody, that's nice. You're actually changing the dynamics of the universe. And you do that, whether it's in a physical hug or it's a spiritual hug, or it's some type of reaching to someone, you are correcting a, a pagam, a, a default in the so-called program. And every time we do it, it's repaired. And collectively, when all of these are repaired, we will come to that point that I quoted earlier, that the world will be covered in divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. So we have that power to bring water back into a dry land, which basically means to bring unity back into division and divisiveness. And that's a choice everybody here makes, every one of us. Now, thank God, and I thank God all the time that I've been blessed to be able to be part of the, I would say, the fixing side of things. That doesn't mean you don't, there aren't challenges. There are many times, you know, it's not, it's not always made easy. And I'm sure uh, there are plenty of my own, we all have our own iniquities and challenges and faults. But to know that your life is dedicated to that and you do everything possible to that is a great gift. And frankly, it's not just myself, it's all of us here. This is our question. This is the challenge we have. So we come here, Sukkis, after Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah was, we stood in awe before God. They say, Smeili Tachas Lereshi. It's more Yomim Narayim. It's more the, the left side, the side of justice, the side of awe, the side of, of uh, standing modestly in the face of God, asking for what we need, reaching, our, reaching up. And that definitely comes with a certain distance. But then the second half, Yemini Dechabkeni, comes the embrace. Now it's not just you standing before the great God. It's you are bringing God's unity into the world. And we do that with the love of Sukkot. And we do it with the full moon as begins this Friday night. We sit in the Sukkot. And then we extend it also on the next morning, the first morning this year, not on Shabbos, but on Sunday morning, we take the four species, what do you think the message of that ultimately is? Again, it says four species and to bring them together by good achas, the one bond. You're binding four different species and showing unity. These four species are as far apart as possible. One has scent and taste, the esrik. One has no scent and no taste, the arava, the willow. And the other has one has scent and no taste, the one has taste and no scent, which is uh, the, the lulav and the and the myrtle branches. And you bring these four different types of species which reflect four different types of people. People who have both Torah, knowledge, and refined behavior, good deeds. People who have neither, or people who have one or the other. And you bind them by good achas. That's what we say, that you bind them all as one. So it's again a demonstration of unity in a world of fragmentation. And throughout sukkahs, that is the theme. We dance together. What do you think dancing together is? Dance, in a sense, is an equalizer, like song is. It's an equalizer because everybody can dance. Whether you're a scholar or you're a simple person, a child or an adult, every type of person. Simchas Torah, we dance actually with the Torah scroll wrapped up. So you can't even see the distinction between a scholar and... You're not studying. You're dancing. Everyone can dance with the scroll tied, rolled up. So you constantly themes of agdus and unity throughout this whole holiday. And it all begins with the unifying hug of sukkahs first night and throughout the seven, eight days of uh, Sukkot. So, there you go. That is the, we'll call it, 
the, the anatomy of a hug, um, the spiritual anatomy, the Kabbalah of the hugs. And uh, I think his message is clear, both for Sukkot and how we behave even before Sukkot and, of course, afterwards. And uh, it's a personal message to us all. So, with that being said, I want to wish everybody a uh, very hugging, uh, hugful, I guess, um, embrace for Sukkot all year round. And we go from um, Kippur to Sukkot. And in our own way, how we're going to do some hugging here is next Wednesday. A little change of schedule. We're going to do a Sukkot party. 7.30 instead of 8.15, right here. And it's going to be with some words, but also a lot of music. We're going to have a whole uh, bunch of live jazz here. Yeah. Some jazz musicians, uh, including Rabbi Greg Wall. Rabbi Greg Wall, however. And uh, Philip and a bunch of other uh, mystery uh, guests. So I really want to welcome you all. There's going to be a pretty good party here, I would say. Everyone knows the parties we throw here are not bad. So yourself or anyone you want to bring along or you want to let people know, please, by all means, the next Wednesday. And I'm, we'll send out an email announcing it. If you have not left your email address, and uh, please leave it by uh, the front. First of all, for announcing and just to stay in contact and in touch. And, okay, so that's Sukkot. That's next Wednesday night. Philip will be doing his class tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and he's uh, himself a singer-songwriter. He'll also be here next Wednesday. So that's uh, also special. And um, beyond that, if anybody needs help with arrangements and sitting in a sukkah or anything like that, or some, somewhere to be hosted or, be, uh, or host, you can please speak to me. I'll be happy to help make arrangements. If uh, I, I, I would also be able to welcome some of you to my sukkah if you like. I don't know what your schedules are like, but if anyone's open to that idea, just let me know. I'll try to extend the invitation personally to as many as I can, but I'm just announcing it as well. And uh, that goes even for the people listening in on the web, even though I know there's someone in New Zealand that listens faithfully. So I don't know if she can make it from New Zealand here for Sukkot, but uh, just to show you technology, unity. Okay. So, um, may you be hugged by God, by the Sukkah, by the people that love you, and... Uh, and really, in a way, not just, uh, not just uh, let's call it uh, mechanically, symbolically, a token hug, but an actual real one that makes you feel connected, lifted, strengthened by something higher than ourselves. Everyone have a very good Yom Tov, and uh, again, a pleasure to always share and teach here. And, uh, and I'm sure much more to come as we go along in programming here, as you'll be hearing things coming up in this new year. Again, if anybody wants me to sign the 60 days, I'm here available to do so. This is a 60-day book that, I have been, that has a lot of these themes I've discussed here. And 60 days goes all the way till the end of the holiday season. So everyone have a good Yom Tov. It's an honor pleasure. Thank you.